Today on This Week in Music, we have Kristen Thompson of the Future Music Coalition here to talk to us about some primary research they're doing into how artists make money in 2011. Stay tuned. I feel good, uh, even though I shouldn't. I'm chilling so hard, couldn't tell you where the hood is. Uh, I'm looking like a million bucks, sucker. I'm Welcome to This Week in Music. Our guest today is Kristen Thompson from the Future Music Coalition. It's an organization that's been around since 2000, doing some really progressive policy work in the music business. Kristen, are you there? Yes, I am. Thanks, Ian. Thanks for joining us. You're uh, via Skype from DC today, correct? From Philadelphia. Oh, you're in Philly. That's right. Yeah. I apologize. Um, thank you for coming, joining sure. us. Sure. Um, the uh, tell tell us I'm I'm I've always I remember when Future Music Coalition came on the scene, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it was presented in some circles as kind of an alternative to the RIAA. It was sort of those guys have a gun, we need a gun too. Is that true? I'm not sure we were thinking about it that way, but what it, it did come out of um, something that. I was participating in in the 90s, um, which was um, my friend Jenny Toomey and I ran an independent record label called Simple Machines. And we were based in Washington, D.C. Um, you were and, in a band together too, correct? Yes, we were in a band called Tsunami. But D.C. has always been noted as a, a scene that's very has a very strong do-it-yourself do ethic. Um, Discord Records is in Washington, D.C., amongst other labels, and we'd always really embraced the philosophy of Discord in having fair relationships with artists and really building community around music. And in the late 90s, Jenny and I were both really fascinated uh, about how the internet was changing the playing field for artists and independent record labels. And we started to just do interviews with people and we realized there was this whole component to the music industry that we had not really noticed before, even though we'd run a label for eight years. Um, there was these policy aspects. There was a legal side to it that we had never really uh, understood very well. And we met a whole bunch of new people, including a couple of the FMC founding board members, one of them, Brian Zisk, who's in San Francisco, and Walter McDonough in, in um, Boston. Right, and, and um, Brian, Brian now um, hosts the SF Music Tech, which I'm sure a lot of our, our viewers are familiar with. And, absolutely. And, uh, and Walter Walter's a lawyer in Boston, correct? That's right. So, you know, this was sort of pre-FMC, pre but we realized in about 2000 that there was, um, a neat, there was an opportunity where artists could become stakeholders in these conversations that were happening about how the Internet was changing the playing field and what particular rates would be and how copyright would be uh, modified. And we thought that independent artists and artists of all types, the so folks even signed to big labels, needed... Um, could, could benefit from having an, another voice in the conversation. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's, I, I commend you guys on doing that. I mean, that was a time when, you know, the traditional music industry was still very much in denial as to what the impact of the internet would be. I mean, 1999 and 2000 were really the peak um, of the internet generally, but you guys re really saw, particularly from the independence point of view, what it, what it was. So what was your mission? You know, you start the Future Music Coalition with, with uh, with Jenny and Brian and Walter, um, and you know how how did you do it and where did you start? It's funny to think about the the uh, you know the idea of starting a nonprofit, but it did come out of this concept that um, or this this realization that um, it was there was a a need and a. Um, an opportunity for us to participate in these ongoing policy decisions. There was a lot going on, especially in 1999, 2000. It was just the beginning of um, of the digital performance royalty, which might sound very obscure to me, to the re the listeners here, but it's the basis on which how the webcasting rates are distributed back to recording artists and record labels. It's how Pandora pays the rights holders. And um, this law had just been enacted or, you know, built in the late 90s. And the distribution model th uh, through sound exchange was just beginning. And so there were all these opportunities for artists to engage in the policymaking process. And so FMC just jumped in. We just got really involved, not only in that, but also in everything from radio, the effect of radio consolidation and the 1996 Telecommunications Act to uh, what was going on with internet policy. 
Uh, you guys did, did some primary research on, on the radio consolidation, is that true? Yeah, we've done quite a bit. Um, in, we've had three particularly, um, well, specific reports, and most of them had to do with how radio station ownership had changed since the 1996 Telecommunications Act allowed uh, radio station owners to buy, the, the, the national caps disappeared, so you could buy as many stations as you wanted. And in some cases, um, some corporate owners, you know, amassed a great number of stations with Clear Channel leading the way. And we wondered what the impact had been on uh, playlist composition and whether artists had um, a better chance or not as good a chance of being played on the air. Um, so we did a lot of work on um, what, it, what the playlists looked like post-consolidation. And we found that basically there was a lot of hom homogeneity and very little access to the airwaves. Right. So what do you do with that? So you, you figure that out and then what, what, do you, what do you do? How do you, how do you then try to affect some change? Well, we certainly, um, the research was very well, you know, we, there was a lot of folks who were very interested in the research and there was media coverage and all that, but we also, it would also, something we would take to the Federal Communications Commission, speak with commissioners, speak with their research department, talk to them about the ways that they should um, be assessing the licensees that they're responsible for. Um, we encourage them to think beyond just thinking of stations as, um, oh, this is a rock station, this is a jazz station, but think about what the content of the playlists are. Like, or is a rock station and a, or no, let's say, is an AC station and a hot AC station, is that actually diversity? You know, we have to look at the playlists to figure out what um, a diverse radio spectrum looks like, because that is part of the FCC's mandate. Plus, plus we also just talk to policymakers. I mean, um, there are a number of federal elected officials who really care about diversity on the airwaves, and they were always very interested in our research because it gave them more, um, more information about how they should frame their own thinking about how uh, radio should be um, uh, managed. I think it's I think it's pretty pretty amazing. I'm, I, what I'm picturing is I'm picturing you know you and Jenny and Brian and Walter just sitting around over dinner and going yeah we should totally do this, <laughs> and then you know cut to not that long later talking to the FCC sitting with you know sitting with policymakers you know uh, how like on a personal level what was that transition like from having you know being in a band and having a record label to you know being in D.C. with policymakers. It was fascinating, um, especially because when we ran Simple Machines, we were just across the river in Arlington, Virginia. I mean, we were five miles from the FCC's headquarters, but we had never really thought about um, musicians having a, having a conversation or a stake in that, that, just because for us, you know, getting played on college radio was one thing. Sure, we could get played on, you know, WPRB, but we would never, ever think about being played on commercial radio. It just didn't seem possible because it seemed like it was the world of just major label artists. Um, so for us to be able to go, and I must admit, I must say that um, Michael Bracey, who is another founding board member right. of Future Music Coalition, has been instrumental in us being able to talk to policymakers and to the FCC because he um, has experience with government relations and um, was able to help us navigate this because it was a brand new world for us. But it wasn't it wasn't scary or difficult because I felt we felt like our our research was good and we had standing. Like we 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 wanted. Radio, we want radio to be better, so we wanted to talk to the policymakers about how it could be better. And, and what has there been a moment when you've, um, when you really thought, you know, wow, we are, we're, we're, we're making progress with this organization. And what was the first time that you thought, you know, when you really felt an impact for, of the work that you'd done? Hmm. Oh, there's, there's been, you know, I would say that the. And I, I can't say FMC is solely responsible for this, but we were part of a coalition of, of organizations that ensured that musicians, so the recording artists part of um, the webcasting rates, the money that comes through Sound Exchange, the fact that the money goes directly to recording artists and simultaneously to record label owners, I think it was a really big win. I, and I would agree. Let's talk about that for a second, because yeah. not everybody watching might know that that's even the case. So. Yep. Um, you know, so and, and let me let me see if I can do this, and you tell me if I botch it. But um, you know, on, on in traditional and terrestrial radio, 
um, there's the, there's uh, effectively you know zero percent paid out in a in, in a in a comparable way um, to artists and satellite. I believe the number is around seven percent, mm-hmm. uh, but that number is is very high on the digital side. Um, it, relatively speaking, uh, it might not be. Um, a tremendous amount of money in total, but on a percentage of revenue base, it's it's um, it's high. It's much higher than zero or seven percent. Put it that way, um, and then and that money is paid directly to an organization called Sound Exchange, and then as you're saying, Sound Exchange takes that money and and divides it up in two places. One is is to whoever owns the master recording or you know usually the record label, and the other is that payment goes directly to the artist. Yeah, that's exactly right, and. Um, just to uh, there was a there was a time back in the begin the, the conversation around this in the early two thousands was the question was should the money go through the record label and then get distributed to the artist after the you know as part of a, an accounting to the artist through the label and there were a lot of folks that said you know lots of organizations that represent artists including AFM and AFTRA that said, we want, we think it should be direct payment to the recording artists and simultaneously to the record labels. And FMC was agreed with that. And we think it was um, an, a really big win just because it ensures that artists are compensated for the digital performances directly instead of having it potentially uh, caught up in other royalty account, I mean, other revenue accountings with their record label, maybe uh, used as money that pays for recoupable costs or something. Yeah, we, like. I mean, we all we all know artists who have uh, you know sold a million records and will never see a royalty check. Yeah. Um, so I, I agree. I think that's I think that's incredible work. I mean, especially as I mean, Sound Exchange. Um, you know, I I was I was told by by one of the labels on condition of anonymity that um, you know that it, it it will in 2012 be their number two overall revenue stream. Um, yeah. So at the time that you guys negotiated that, um, Sound Exchange was was you know negligible in terms of actually paying any money in anyone. But now this thing that's a great growing revenue stream uh, actually pays artists directly. So I, I, I think that's a that that is uh, you know thank you for for oh. for, for being a part of that. What, sure. Um, as, I, as I said, FMC was just one of many organizations. So yeah. So, so tell me a little bit about the policy summit. Um, is that and, and you know you do this big event every every year. How long have you been doing it for? Uh, we started into to the end of two thousand. Well, it was basically January two thousand one. So this will be our tenth summit. Um, and uh, what ha- it's usually in Washington D.C. The only year it wasn't was in two thousand six when we did it in Montreal, which was really fun. But um, ten- it tends to be in Washington D.C. And we bring together. Um, folks who are at the intersection of music and law and technology, but we also add this policy component because in Washington, D.C., there's an opportunity to bring together um, all these different um, folks that have different roles to play, but also bring the policymakers into the conversation so that they they can either hear how it's working from the musicians or the uh, attorney's perspective, but also um, talk about how they perceive their role in sh- ensuring that musicians and other rights holders are compensated or whatever the issue is. So we, we try to bring together all the different components because we think that the conversation is always strengthened by having by having as many people as possible in the conversation. Sorry, I just lost you off my screen for a second. That's all right. um, having as many people as possible and as many stakeholders as possible in the dialogue. And and so when is it? It's it's coming up in just a couple of weeks in DC. Yeah, it's and, uh, October. And what's, th- what's the program? What's the program look like this year? Just give us an example of the kind of sure. things that that you guys have at the, at the program itself. Sure, it's October third and fourth uh, at Georgetown University. So that's a Monday and Tuesday. Uh, we're covering a lot of different things. I'll give you a few. Like um, we're doing a conversation about how ticketing has changed in the post Live Nation Ticketmaster merger. There's been a lot of interesting stuff going on, like ticket, ticketing companies popping up, uh, festivals trying different strategies, um, venues a- adopting new models, and artists trying to do direct ticketing. There's a lot of lot going on. Then we're doing one about um, about blank about licensing, about what's going on with um, with direct versus blanket licensing. Um, there's a lot of a lot of issues out there that we'll we'll cover. Um, we're doing one about um, we're doing um, one about um, the global repertoire database concept, which is something that um, has been a, definitely been a 
conversation or an idea that's been around there for a few years, but there's um, folks who think that it's important that we think about having a meta database uh, so that we, we can ensure that money that's generated from various, uh, um, you know, various uh, streams or sales around the world can all, can all make sure that it accounts properly and gets back to the rights holders. It's a, it's a huge problem. I mean, I'll say when I was at, um, when I was at Yahoo Music, one of the things that it, it, it was just, it was impossible to build that database. Like no one could afford to do it as a service. So we always pushed it back on the labels. You know, when we would do the, when we would do our deals, we would say, look, we can't, we can't go track down actually every songwriter and rights holder. We like we don't have the data. You don't have the data. Publishers actually don't have the data. In most cases, you ask them for it, and you know they, they say, well, yeah, we actually you know we, we actually don't don't have it in a format that you can you know put into a computer, right? Um, there's a pile of papers behind me, and you can go through it if you want, basically. Um, so I, I I think that you know it's it's a it's a value that a lot of Intermediaries have have ended up offering. You know, we used you know, a company like MusicNet um, mm -hmm. to do that, or in the U.S. the, the labels do it, or you know, you've got some of the um, uh, you know performance rights societies. You know, in in other countries, try to try to amass that data. Um, so I, I I think that there's a, there are a bunch of base issues that I'm surprised aren't sorted out in music yet, and there being, you know, kind of a, you know, a real canonical metadata database uh, is, is, is one of them. I would love to see a database like that actually include the rights as well, so that, you know, if I were an app developer, I could just go to one place and say, I want to build awesome apps with music. Is, can, I, can I do that without paying someone a gigantic advance? Um, so, you know, that, that, that may still be a pipe dream, but having the data all in one place would definitely be a, be a great first step. Yep, yep, and you can see that, you know, even the way you described it, you need the tech people, the lawyers, the policymakers, everybody in the conversation, uh, because there's so many different facets to the to what's going on. Yeah. So, yeah, there, we're also having a, a few keynotes this year. Um, Maria Palante, who's the new head of the Copyright Office, is speaking. Um, we're also honoring um, Commissioner Michael Copps from the Federal Communications Commission this year, just as a small honor, because he's been such a uh, sort of a st staunch advocate of the citizens' right to, you know, good radio and pu public, the public's um, oversight of the communications issues. So, so who who attends the policy summit? If I'm a if I'm if I'm a musician, should I come? If I'm a lawyer, should I come? Like, what what's the what what, what who, who's the constituency? It's um, anybody who considers himself a stakeholder in the music technology space, especially musicians. Um, we uh, offer musicians um, scholarships to come to the summit that reduce the price dramatically that you can find out about on our website. And uh, t lots of musicians come, and I think sometimes they're the best participants because they can speak with authority about what it's like to be a musician and having to navigate these emerging technologies or these copyright issues or these legal concerns. Because um, it's, it's interesting having, say, a, a panel of lawyers talk about a you know, technical issue, but until a musician asks a question or says, well, that's not what it's like for me, then the conversation is only enriched when people ask those questions. So let's just say it that way. Right. Um, well, speaking of, of musicians, you, I mentioned at the top of the show the, the research that you guys are doing right now around artist revenue streams. Yeah. Um, I think this is, I, I can't wait to, to see this. I think that it, it's, um, I was talking with, with Mike Masnick at Tech Dirt about it uh, last week. And why I think there are a bunch of us that are that are you know kind of kind of sitting here going like this you know can't wait till you guys um, publish this so we can kind of try to get a sense of what's really going on, yeah. right? Because we all we all know what's happening to the compact disc business. Um, I think that that you know we don't know what that means um, you know for artists necessarily, um, mm -hmm. and it, and. What you guys uh, are doing right now with this Artist Revenue Streams project um, is out there. You're, you're, it's, it's really a research project to, to find out what's really going on, right? So who's, you know, who, who's funding it and how are you doing it? Well, the, I'll start with the how we're doing it. So the, um, the, the, we're approaching this in a, a traditional research sense. We have three methodologies that we're using simultaneously. 
because we think one methodology wouldn't wouldn't do justice to the the complexity of the issue. So um, we're looking at U.S.-based musicians and composers, um, and the, we're doing in-person interviews with about 25 different musician types because we know just on our own experience that the revenue streams available to say a um, a songwriter that does not perform, say it's a Nashville songwriter or somebody who's in LA that just just composes music for somebody else to sing, the revenue streams available to that person is very different from the person that's in a professional orchestra who only performs and never composes and may never put it, their music on a recorded disc. So we wanted to make sure we talk to all these different musician types and we have 25. We're also doing, as a second part, financial case studies. So in the cases where we have access to musicians, a particular musicians, um, books, if they allow us to, to show, if they, are allow, if they allow, if they show us their, their financial records, we're able to develop sort of a pie chart based on an annual uh, revenue streams uh, assessment. And then if they have enough data, we can do a time series to show how things have changed over time. And then the third component is a very large online survey that's open to U.S.-based musicians and composers um, that's run, started in September, on September 6th, and is open until the end of October and is available, you can access it at futuremusic.org slash ARS. And um, we're hoping that thousands of musicians will take it because the more data we get, the better the outcomes will be as far as us being able to make sort of a, a rich a, assessment of what it's like to be a musician in the United States right now. All right, so if you know, so artists watching right now, please go take it. Um, what, what's what's your goal as FMC with the, with the survey? There's a, quite a few with the with the research project as a whole. It really dovetails with what FMC has been interested in when and, and engaging with for the past 11 years. You know, we've all witnessed and experienced and been part of these enormous changes that have happened, especially since the appearance of, say, Napster in 1999 until now. Um, there are tons of new technologies. There's new revenue streams that didn't exist before. There's um, new ways that artists are leveraging their brand in order to, you know, make money on merchandise or VIP ticketing. There's all this stuff going on. And just as you said, Ian, I mean, there's certainly some assessments about the status of the state of the music industry coming from the top down. Like, there's tons of data out there, right? Like, we can look at, you know, who's the most popular tweeted, you know, artist and how many people, how many digital downloads has iTunes sold? Like, there's tons of data, but it's very top down. And what this research project is trying to do is look at it from the bottom up. You know, what does it look like from an individual's perspective and how has their revenue pie changed over time? I mean, if, if it's true that um, folks are selling fewer recorded CDs, um, which the, the sort of top-down data implies, well, is it true for every artist? Like, and does it change from genre to genre? Like, what does it look like? And so that's why we're curious about um, collecting this data to figure it out. It seems like the hardest thing um, would, will be to get a representative data set. I mean, a certain type of artist is going to submit their, their, their information online. Um, you know, you've got, your, you've got the 25 types of artists, which I think, I think makes sense. You're sure you get more data across a representative set, but how do you know, you know how many of each of these 25 categories exist in the world in the end, or how do you get um, you know, an, an, an artist who, who is not, who is not maybe, you know, a, a bootstrapping artist in, in the long tail to come, to come take the survey. You've hit on something that has, um, been a challenge for us from, from the very beginning, because unlike other surveys or other research projects, it's very difficult to know what a representative sample is because there's no, there's no directory of music, musicians in the United States. Um, there's no number of us that we can rely on that says, oh, there's this many musicians in the States. It doesn't really exist. So we've done our best to try and figure out what, 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 the, what various populations are and how to access them. So 
through not only the interview phase, but also through the survey, we're doing um, very specific marketing to various constituencies, like the jazz folks, the classical folks, the indie rockers, the unsigned artists versus the sort of signed artists that are already represented by labels. So um, we're, we're doing our best with this situation because not only is there no sort of target number for representation, but also there's no way for us to actually access everybody. So it's um, important for us to use every avenue possible to reach musicians and composers. Right. I mean, if, if, and, and if, I'm, a, if, if I'm an artist, you know, do I want to give the FMC all of my data? Like what's, what, should I be worried about that for any reason? The survey itself is voluntary and anonymous. Um, all the data that anyone submits is just aggregated with thousands of other artists that are taking the survey. So nobody is, would particularly be, um, you know, there's nobody that would uh, be personally uh, uh, exposed through this process, especially through the survey. And with our interviews, they're also anonymous. Um, and we are allowing our folks who are interviewed to make a choice later about whether they want to be identified by name once they see how we write up the reports and stuff like that and how they see them represented in context with everything else. Right. So I would encourage folks to take it out. if you. It's, I think, um, a, a really interesting survey. And in fact, we've heard from some people who have taken it that they it's eye-opening because it gives them through, as they kind of threaded through the survey questions, um, they realized that there are a bunch of revenue streams that maybe they had never even thought about or heard of or considered. So even if, you know, just take it. And if you, and if you don't like it, you can click out of it and exit. No big deal because, you know, but again, it is anonymous. You don't have to tell us who you are or anything. No, I think, I absolutely think artists should take it. I mean, we collectively, um, you know, we, we need the data so that, so that we can all try to, uh, you know, try to do a better job in, in, in the music business. I, I think that, you know, there's no question that, that music is in a, um, you know, it's a, it's a trying time, you know, as, as we've said a lot. We're in this in-between phase from where you, you guys were, where the industry was when FMC started, when, you know, the, the old model was working. Now we're in this in-between phase. We know the old model isn't working, but we don't really know what the new model is. And studies like this can point the way. Um, toward toward what a what a new model can be, but obviously I, I also love that it's not it, it, it the the um, research addresses the fact head on, which is there is no one size fits all solution. Mm -hmm. There never has been. When people talk about the music business, um, you know they they always leave out a lot of the other ways that people made money in the music business in the past, whether it was you know, ind independent music, or as, as you've referred to, you know, classical music or songwriters or, or whatever. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to, to see the outcome of this. I, I have, you know, a, a few things that, that, you know, I can, I can think about that I, that I would love to, um, you know, to, to get from the data, but what, what are your plans for the data when it's done? What, what should we expect to see? How will it be presented back to us? Um. You'd think that, oh, we're going to just, you know, type up a 300-page report, but um, we send, have a sense that nobody would read that. So what we hope is that um, we can provide a s snapshots and um, really visually based um, data that um, weaves together some of the themes that we're hearing from our interviews with financial case studies and then comparative data from the survey. I have a sense that we'll do a lot of different releases so that we show various aspects of what we've learned through short, you know, white paperish five to six pages with a lot of cool graphs and stuff like that. Um, plus, we'll just be able to talk about it publicly at the events and other other things because we have a sense that it's better, easily, more easily digested in smaller pieces. Um, so very, there's that. Very, and, very yeah. modern of you. Very modern of you too, right? Yeah. Very, very, very internet to uh, break it up into small, <laughs> digestible pieces and give it to us in ways that we can retweet. Yeah, Maybe absolutely. the whole report could come out less than 140 characters at a time. Wow, I, I hadn't thought of that. But yeah. um, there's that in the spectrum. But I was also thinking that perhaps a double CD musical. Right. I hadn't thought of the musical aspect yet. These, uh, these ideas are free. We should do this yeah. more often. I. I um, yeah, we could, we could uh, come up with probably maybe one and a half more of those ideas if you needed. <laughs> um, I will. I'm I'm really I'm really really glad to see that you guys are doing it. So that, this is you're 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 definitely FMC ten years in. Congratulations on on ten years. Extraordinarily busy. You got your 
you're, I mean, I guess you're really, you know, 11 plus years in, but you got your 10th policy summit um, this year. You've got, you've got this great um, research project on artist revenue streams. Uh, what, what else is, is going on? Not that that's not enough. Is there, is there anything else we should know about at the moment? Sure. Um, I'll mention one more thing, which is um, just because it has a time, a deadline, which is um, FMC since 2005 has been helping musicians navigate the health insurance landscape. We have a project called Hint, the health insurance navigation tool, and um, it provides free advice to musicians, anyone who calls us to make an appointment, and you can figure out what's available and possible for you to get as far as health insurance coverage goes. It's based on where you live, maybe how many kids you have, whatever, just the, the basic criteria. Um, we don't sell any plans, we just offer advice, but we've done it for free since 2005 because we know that musicians are uh, twice as likely to have not have insurance than the general public. Wow. But so do we know at, what, what percentage of, of musicians have or, or don't have health insurance? I mean, twice as, twice as likely to not have insurance is... A, is a pretty scary thing. I mean, and, and then I guess, you know, this is why organizations like Music Cares exist because, yes. you know, so many artists find themselves in trouble, but you're, you're this is sort of a, a preventative help. Well, yeah, I mean, we found it just through anecdotal, just through knowing musicians that musicians tend to be uninsured. And we've done two surveys of uh, musicians in the past, and the last one was June of 2010, and 33 percent of the folks who responded to the survey didn't have insurance. Um, and that kind of fits our sort of basic sort of anecdotal understanding of it. Um, and we can understand why. I mean, cost is a factor. And, and trying to navigate the health insurance system is also difficult, which is almost set up to be, you know, to make it difficult. And um, and then there's so, – so Hint has been trying to tackle those two things, like give musicians – some sense of how to navigate it and also tell them about what affordable plans there are. But I bring this up because the Affordable Health Care Act that was passed in March or May of 2010 um, uh, has a mandate on it so that almost all American citizens are going to need to have coverage by 2014. So I think the artist community, the musicians, we all have a serious task ahead of us to try and help musicians and other artists um, navigate the system and find coverage before 2014. And so FMC is working in a small coalition right now to sit around and figure out how, how, would, how are we going to get there. Gotcha. Well, let me come back to an earlier question. Um, before we wrap up, we need to wrap mm -hmm. up in a couple of minutes. Uh, how is FMC funded? FMC is funded through a combination of grants, um, um, earned income from our events, and some, some private donations from individuals. Gotcha. And the, the so for something like the Artist Revenue Streams program, is, is that, do you get a grant specifically to do that research, or do you get a grant for FMC overall that then you choose what to do with? Um, it, it was specifically, it's uh, for the project, and most of the money, uh, the large amount of support is coming from the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation. Gotcha. Um, there are other smaller funders who have, have supported um, particular aspects or certain events of the project, including a little bit of money from YouTube and some from the East Bay Community Foundation. Got you. And and is that is that difficult? I mean, do you, is is running a not for profit like this a you know is is it a, a a hustle to to make that money come in year after year, or or do you guys have enough support you know that that it you know that it's been a it's been easier than that? Um, I think I would say that probably most of the folks that work in the nonprofit world would say that it's always a challenge to find funding. Um, there are, there's lots of really interesting um, or organizations and uh, foundations out there that support the arts, but there's also a lot of nonprofits seeking funding. So there are, um, we're continuously trying to figure out how to balance our programmatic goals with potential funding. And, you know, it's always a challenge, but I'd say probably any nonprofit would say the same thing, so. Right. Um well, I think you know it's 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 great it's great work that you guys are doing, and and you know we we're all we're all you know grateful for it. But if we if if we want to help, if people are you know moved by by what you're saying and the work that you guys are doing, and they want to help out, um, how can they help? You know, I, I guess go to your website and PayPal you some loot. But what about <laughs> volunteering or just spreading the word? What what's what's um what's the What's the best thing that someone could do if they wanted to support the cause? 
the the most direct way to support us is financially, and we take donations on our website uh, at our donate link. Um, and there's lots of different uh, levels of support that we'd appreciate. Um, but you can also come to our events. Um, our policy summit in October, October third and fourth, is a fantastic opportunity. Um, we also do other events around the country. Um, on a you know, it de- just depends on year to year what's going on. So the best way to keep up with us is either to sign up for our newsletter or follow us on Facebook or Twitter, uh, because we tend to make sure that anybody who's following us on those platforms knows what we're up to. Um, you can also support our uh, some of our policy work by engaging in some of the campaigns we work on. You know, whether it's say say you um, want to write a letter to the FCC or say you want to. Um, so you want, so you really care about a particular issue. We can always help musicians um, speak to policymakers. So we're ha- we're happy to help with that as well. Awesome, thank you. Well, uh, before I let you go, I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you a question. That at the end of the show, I w- I always like to talk about music a little bit. Um, what are you What are you listening to right now? Did you have a favorite summer record? Anything that that you're loving going into the fall? That that that, that people should that if if you know. If, one of you came to one of our listeners. They said, "Give me one record that I have to hear this year." What do, What do you think it might be? Uh, this year, well, I don't know. I went to see My Morning Jacket at the Man um, about three weeks ago, and they were so good. I mean, I'd seen them before, but they pl- played for three hours. It was incredible. And so I've been on a My Morning Jacket um, jag for about two weeks now, just listening to their entire catalog. Right. Um, but there's a record that came out last year um, that I tend to listen to a lot, which is the Besnard Lakes record. The Besnard Lakes are the Roaring Night, which I just love. Um, and they're uh, uh, on Jag Jaguar. Um, so those are the two I find myself listening to more than, you know, more than others. Awesome. The Jag Jaguar, we had Darius from Jag Jaguar on the program last week. So yeah. thanks, for, uh, thanks for giving us some, you know, some <laughs> continuity from show there to show. There you go. Yeah. All right, well, it's really good to see you. Um, Thank you, you know, Ian. Stay, stay dry in Philly. I will. And uh, I'll see you soon. Thanks again Thank for you. joining us. Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for watching This Week in Music. Please, uh, please do go to thisweekin.com slash music, and there you'll find links to do all the things you need to do, like follow us on Twitter and um, subscribe to the, the podcasts on iTunes, et cetera. Uh, you can follow us um, on or be our our, uh, our friend and likable person on Facebook as well, facebook.com slash This Week in Music. So that's all from me this week. Uh, I'll see you guys next week, and be good. I feel good, uh. even though I shouldn't. I'm chilling so hard, couldn't tell you where the hood